On October 25th, just weeks before Sudan's military was supposed to hand over control of the transitional government to civilian leadership, General Abdel Fattah el-Burhan seized control in a military coup and declared a state of emergency. The military dissolved the joint civilian military government and arrested Prime Minister Hamdok. Protesters have taken to the streets to denounce the coup, but security forces have responded forcefully, killing at least 15 people and injuring hundreds at the time of recording. Joining me now to discuss this is Sudan's ambassador to the United States, uh, Nuruddin Sati. Thank you so much for joining me, sir. No, thank you very much for having me. So, on October 28th, three days after General Burhan uh, dissolved the government, you look on state-run Sudan TV, and there's an announcement that you have been fired from your position. Um, are you still ambassador to the United States? Very firmly so, because I have been um, fired uh, by an illegal, illegitimate government. Actually, the decision of, um, you know, firing me came from the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, um, who does not have the right to fire me, or to fire any uh, ambassador or diplomat. It's for this reason that I do not recognize uh, that uh, action. General Burhan uh, claims he ousted the government uh, to avoid, quote, a civil war, he says. Uh, he says the dangers we witnessed last week could have led the country into civil war. Uh, is there any truth to that? Um, I do not think so, frankly. He should have told us between who and who. Uh, we do not know exactly uh, who are those, the parties of this civil war. Uh, and frankly, I think, on the contrary, this, uh, this act might lead to a civil war if it continues for too long. Between whom? Um, between the, the people and, and, the, and those who are carrying the arms who are want to uh, enforce a military rule in Sudan. The reason I ask that is because there have been multiple forces at play for a while now. It was a bit surprising uh, when you said uh, you expected everything but this when the coup happened. Uh, but there have been several coup attempts since 2019, uh, including one just in September. Uh, what's prompting all of these different takeovers, these attempts to take over the government? Well, um, the most recent one, or the last one, was prompted uh, by the fear uh, of, you know, handing over uh, control of the government to the civilians, uh, for uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, the, the first one is uh, accountability. Uh, we know that there have been some crimes that have been committed in the past, and uh, there are investigations which are ongoing uh, on these uh, um, crimes. And I think uh, some of the military feared that this might turn against them. The other one, uh, the investigations was going on uh, issues of, um, I would say, um, the assets of the state and how they are governed and how they are managed and, 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 and some issues related to that. So there was the fear also uh, this uh, might turn against them also. Mm. What role does uh, Prime Minister Hamdok play in this? I mean, he had some pre pretty unpopular policies. Uh, for example, adopting IMF reforms, uh, like slashing fuel subsidies. Uh, the country has been suffering from medicine, wheat shortages, and inflation has topped 400 percent. To what extent uh, have these moves fueled the popular discontent? Well, there, is a, there has no popular discontent per se. I mean, there have been anti-government protests going on at least a week before the coup. So, clearly, there was some well, discontent. Well, of course. But it turned out that uh, the same military, uh, who pretend now to redress the course of, of things, uh, have been withholding, uh, you know, many of these things. Do you know that the prices of, of fuel and, and bread and all that have, have fallen, you know, dramatically in the last uh, week? Mm. <laughs> and uh, supplies uh, have been coming from all directions, uh, despite the blockade on Port Sudan. That means there had been some hoarding uh, intentionally being done in order to put the government in, in difficulty. Not but but can, say, two can two things be true at the same time? Can, can the military um, have been holding things back for the purpose of fueling popular discontent, but also the prime minister uh, had policies that were clearly unpopular that prompted protests? Well, um, I, I have to say that uh, the civilian government could have done better. There's no doubt about that. But uh, you should not forget that it turned out that some key members of the government are siding with the, with the coup, uh, including the Minister of Finance. Uh, and uh, now he is handing uh, half of the assets of the central bank to the armed forces. 
and it is a matter, you know, of real concern. Yes, um, there were fa failings of the civilian government. There is no doubt about that, and this was to be expected anyway. We knew that the situation was not going to be redressed. I wrote a book actually two years ago saying that the situation will not be redressed within the next five years because we knew uh, what we inherited, the legacy from the past regime was, was horrific and, and it will take a, a, a long time in order to redress that. You mentioned the armed forces. A Sudanese armed forces shut down the internet and other telecommunications uh, shortly after the coup. This happened in 2019 as well. When that happened, uh, state security forces opened fire uh, and killed scores of protesters and injured many others uh, in Khartoum. Do you worry that something like this will repeat itself? Of course. Uh, unfortunately and regrettably, um, they do not seem to have changed their ways. The same uh, dealings of the former regime uh, of al-Bashir that has been toppled mm -hmm. by a popular, you know, uprising are coming back again. Mm. And this is really to be regretted. We thought that we have left all that behind us. One of the challenges, though, is the relationship between those loyalists from the Bashir days who still remain as part of a transitional government. Now, uh, during the previous coup attempt, uh, your government blamed elements loyal to Omar al-Bashir. Uh, and the question is, how are some of those allies who were accused of grave human rights abuses by multiple organizations, by multiple facets, even allowed to be part of this transitional government? Well, th that's a good question. You know, at a certain moments in history, uh, when you want to move forward, uh, you have to compromise. Uh, and it was not easy to compromise. I was part of this dialogue in the beginning. Should we uh, allow those elements to be part of the transitional institutions, or should we uh, not do that? But at the end of the day, for the stability and security of the country, the decision was to allow them to be part uh, of the institutions, the transition institutions, because we knew very well that the balance of power at that time was not in the favor of the civilians, mm. and that we need to redress it gradually as we move towards a more normalized situation. If you could reconsider that decision now, would you still include former Bashir uh, allies in a transitional I, I would still do that, but I would um, you know, immediately uh, take measures uh, that would uh, allow us to continue working together. Like what? Uh, the issue of, um, of, of dealing with civil military relations uh, and the issue of accountability and transitional justice. I think those are key. Mm. Uh, some protesters have not trusted uh, military involvement in the transitional government. They've called for full civilian rule. Uh, is there any possibility, in your estimation, of a government of full civilian rule? There is this possibility, provided that we find a way of associating the military uh, by being part of the state institutions, uh, but realizing that they are not going to be the ones who are be calling the shots, that they will be there to protect the transition, not to control it. Uh, and, and there is a difference between those. Is that possible? Given the history, given the backdrop, given who's in, who, who comprises this military, is that possible I, to negotiate I, something like that? I, I, I think we should, we should be able to negotiate that uh, and go back. Uh, well, the first thing to do uh, is to get out of the situation and find a deal uh, which would make us uh, start a real dialogue on issues uh, and see how to handle them. And then gradually move into this second phase, uh, which is seeing how uh, they can accept to be part of the deal without controlling it. Given the large number of mobilizations and protests, is the coup a done deal? Is it over? Uh, the, the coup uh, is over. I, I do not think that coup is sustainable. It cannot continue. With the, with, the, with the mobilization that we have seen and that we are going to see in the next days and weeks, if it continues, uh, I do not think it's sustainable. They cannot govern the country. They cannot have stability. They will never rest, uh, you know, and, and the people will continue mobilizing and putting pressure on them, um, we, of course, in coordination with the regional and international community. In your estimation, I know diplomats don't love predictions, but 
a month from now, where will Sudan be? Sudan, a month um, from now, will be um, back more or less in, in where it was under the 25th of October. And there was going very tough negotiations in order to see how we can continue working together with the military. That would be my prediction. Notre Dame, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank Absolutely. You. <laughs> well, I appreciate it.